The land on which we stand and create are ancestral territories of many traditional nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We recognize the history, values, and beliefs of these original owners and caretakers that have tended and protected this land long before the nations called Canada or the United States of America. We acknowledge the history of the current claims to this land by nations like Canada and the United States have been built on the immoral and oppressive practices to advance economically. As current stewards of the land, we must demonstrate gratitude to the original caretakers and those who have tilled this land before us without recognition or compensation. We must acknowledge that their history did not begin with chattel slavery. These people were fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, doctors, lawyers, leaders, tribal members, chiefs, warriors, kings, and queens. As much as anti-Black racism still exists today, so does the royalty and sovereignty that North American descendants of slavery have over the land that their ancestors tilled and made prosperous, as well as over their lives and untold stories. Let us receive these stories with open ears and open hearts, knowing that although we may not have personally committed the atrocities of the past, it is our responsibility to ensure they never happen again. We must also accept responsibility for repaying the debt to the descendants of those of whom we owe. We are all indebted to the land on which we live and the people that ensured we live on it with as many of the comforts as we see today. Let us act accordingly, not only today, but for every day to come. We have a breaking story to tell you about this hour. CBC News has learned that black members of the civil service, the Canadian Public Service, both current and former members, have launched a lawsuit against the government, alleging decades of discrimination that kept them from advancing in their careers. The suit aims to represent tens of thousands of employees alleging decades of anti-black discrimination. The class action lawsuit alleges systemic discrimination toward black public employees, specifically that they face discrimination in the hiring process and went up for promotions dating back to the 1970s. Lucy, make no mistake, this is a major development, a significant, a, a landmark case, $900 million that has implications for organizations and institutions across the country. Well Hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Tasia Brown and I'm president of the Canadian Association of Labour Media and I will be moderating tonight's event. I would like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this event from Ottawa, which is situated on Algonquin land, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Nashville people. Most of you are joining us tonight because you have heard that a class action lawsuit was filed against the Canadian federal government on December 3rd alleging a systemic discrimination in the government's hiring and promotional practices the lawsuit would cover nearly 30,000 black public service workers who have been subject to the black um, employee exclusion the claim reaches back 50 years meaning any current or former government worker who identifies as black or of caribbean or african descent and has worked in any federal government department from 1970 would be eligible to join the class action Damages include the wrongful failure to promote, intentional infliction of mental suffering, constructive dismissal, wrongful termination, negligence, and in particular violations of employment law, human rights law, and charter breaches. The plaintiffs are seeking justice in the form of policy changes, improved representation, compensation, and more. Tonight, we will hear from the legal counsel who will be taking this class action to court. We will hear the powerful testimonies of some of the plaintiffs themselves who have been affected by systemic racism within the federal government. We will also hear the reactions of leaders in the labor movement in this historic class action suit. There will be a question and answer period in the later half of tonight's event, so please get your questions ready and post them in the comments section. We will do our best to get to as many questions as we can in the time allotted. To finish off the evening and to honor Black History Month, we will have a music video premiere of the song For the People, a song written and inspired by the enduring spirit of Black workers across Canada. To kick off our program, we will watch our first testimony from one of the lead plaintiffs in the class action suit, Nicholas Thompson. Here is his story. My name is Nicholas Marcus Thompson and uh, 
I've been employed with the Public Service of Canada for the past six years. I represent 800 workers at the Canada Revenue Agency. When I became a Canadian citizen, I distinctly remember the judge saying that Canada is a place where opportunities are endless. That really drove me to, to join the public service. I really thought that it would be a welcoming, all-inclusive place. A big part of the problem is the Employment Equity Act. So the act was created to prevent discrimination, right? What the legislation does for visible minorities is that it places all racialized people into one group. So the employer can consistently, now under this legislation, pick out for hiring and promotion any visible minorities group and meet the definition of the legislation. So the employer can consistently pick out one group and then submit their statistics that they've met the, the legislative requirements. They're exceeding it, as a matter of fact. But that does not include black workers. This is how the systemic issue works, is that you're using the legislation, you're empowered, so you're, you're following the law, and the law is allowing you to leave black workers behind. When we talk about the black class action lawsuit, you know, any black worker can become part of the claim. If we don't stand up today, then tomorrow my children will be subject to the same thing. And the children of many black workers will be subject to the same thing. And that's why this fight is important, so that that can change, so that the public service can be a place where um, you can join and you could work hard and you could be successful and you could climb as high uh, as you want. That's the public service that we're dreaming of. That's the public service that we're fighting for generations of blacks to come. Fighting for an inclusive public service for generations to come, a strong motivator to take up this fight. Thank you, Nicholas, for those poignant words and for sharing your story. If you can identify with Nicholas's story, the members of the Black Class Action team would encourage you to sign up to be part of the class action. To sign up, you can visit blackclassaction.ca and visit more, read more about the suit, hear testimonies of other plaintiffs, and even add your name to the growing list of Black public service workers who are enjoying this historic lawsuit. News of the class action sent shockwaves throughout the labor movement. Various unions and activists have weighed in on this historic lawsuit affecting tens of thousands of past and present workers. The Public Service Alliance of Canada is the largest federal public sector union in Canada, representing nearly 140,000 federal public sector workers. A large part of the members joining in this class action are members of this union. In a public statement made shortly after the lawsuit was filed, the union said it was supporting the class action as part of its ongoing fight against anti-Black racism. The national president of PSAC, Chris Elward, is joining us tonight to deliver a message of support. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Thank you, uh, Tasia. Thank you very much. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you for uh, inviting me this evening just to say a few words. Black History Month, of course, is a time to reflect and celebrate the many contributions made by black people and all people of uh, uh, Caribbean and African heritage. And it's a time to recognize the important role black workers have made to the economic development of Canada, as well as their contributions to the labor movement. Recognizing their contribution also means acknowledging the tremendous challenges black workers have had to face in the workplace across the nation. Challenges like discriminatory hiring practices, being regularly overlooked for promotions, and being subjected to racist sentiments in the workplace. Anti-Black racism is prevalent in Canadian society and the federal public service is not immune. We acknowledge that many skilled Black PSEC members have been limited from career advancement and are disproportionately underrepresented in management and high-ranking positions in the federal public service. This is especially true for black women, 
in the public service who are further marginalized for their gender and further still, if they are a member of the LGBTQ2 plus community, a parent, someone living with a disability, or a senior. The Public Service Alliance of Canada supports the class action lawsuit taken on behalf of tens of thousands of past and present Black federal public service workers, and we will be seeking intervener status in the case. Recently, Treasury Board outlined their strategy to increase diversity and inclusion in the federal public service. And one of their key commitments was to review the Public Service Employment Act to improve diversity in their hiring practices and to address the unfair and very opaque staffing practices that disproportionately impact marginalized workers. PSAC welcomes this review. An overhaul of the federal government's staffing system is long overdue to address systemic barriers that impact our racialized members. But these recommendations alone are not enough. These barriers are not new, and underrepresented groups have waited far too long for action to be taken to improve representation in the public service. PSAC will continue to confront anti-Black racism and all forms of discrimination. Our members deserve to work in an environment that is free of implicit bias and systemic racism, especially within the public service. Canada's public service is stronger and better served when it's made up of workers with diverse backgrounds, perspectives, and lived experiences. I want you to know that your union is standing with you and we will fight alongside you. Black workers must be heard. The contribution of black workers must be recognized and black workers must be valued. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Chris, and thank you so much for those words. Joining me live tonight is Mr. Courtney Betty, one of the leading members of the legal team responsible in taking this class action to court. Mr. Courtney Betty is a former attorney at the Department of Justice in Canada, representing the government of Canada in complex tax, commercial, and litigation manners. Mr. Betty has applied his 20 years of extensive legal experience in both government and the private sector, especially in the areas of international business development. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Mr. Betty. Oh, thank you so much, Tasha. And, uh, you know, my background is interesting because I actually worked at the Department of Justice. I've also worked with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So I understand the workings of the public service. And I just want to thank Chris for this, such a positive message. You know, as we began, to prepare and to look at this case, we looked at a lot of his messages. He's been very consistent in pointing out that this was an issue within the public service. Also want to thank the legal team that has come together. Um, you know, Hugh Scherer and Glenn and Mackie and so many others, John McLaughlin. You know, we built a team of many lawyers from across the country committed to ensuring that this injustice, which goes back 50 years, is remedied. There are no other approaches that we found other than to bring a class action against the federal government. The class action rests also very interestingly with some of the stories you're gonna to hear tonight. And when we began this suit, we were not aware of the extent of the pain and suffering, especially for many of our elderly public service workers who have given their lives to serving Canada and are now sitting in situations where their pensions aren't able to meet their needs, but more importantly, the psychological damage and trauma that they're suffering. So there's a real tragedy, a real injustice that needs to be remedied, a travesty of justice. We're very frustrated so far with the government's response. We issued immediately in a, a, a request that they sit down with individuals such as Chris from the Public Service Alliance of Canada and PIPS and the workers and come up with a solution the government has decided instead to spend millions of dollars to hire a Bay Street law firm to fight against this, what we all think is clear, the element of systemic racism and discrimination within the public service that the prime minister has admitted, that the head of Privy Council has admitted, that so many organizations have already admitted. So the hollow words that we see coming from the government will no longer satisfy the hollow words that's been said 30 years ago 25 years ago, 20 years ago, 15, 10, five years ago, and more recently, four weeks ago. Uh, so we're 
really working now. We have over 5,000 individuals that have signed a petition in support of the class action. We have over 500 plaintiffs and class members that have stepped forward because their voices need to be heard. So we welcome the opportunity the government is providing to have the voices of these public service workers. Unfortunately, there is gonna be pain for them to have to relive, to retell their stories, but that's a decision that our government has made today. So thank everyone for being a part of this. There's just tremendous support from all sources that we're getting. The momentum is building. We have to change this. This is 2021. We cannot go back to the situation that workers were facing in 1970 and somehow think that Canada is immune to the transgressions that we see across the border. Um, we're not. The, the element, George Floyd, everyone saw the knee on his neck. Well, the government of Canada has had the knee on the neck of many public service workers, as you're here tonight, for so many years. They're struggling and they're begging for a solution. So our team, our legal team, which I really appreciate, look forward to working with all of the class members and all individuals who want to stand up for justice and equity. This is really what it is. We're focusing on black public service workers right now. But the benefits that we're going to bring, as Chris appropriately has pointed out, is going to apply to all sectors. And as Chris, you know, also mentioned, the intersectionality and the suffering of black female workers who right now form about 65 percent of the registered class members is a whole other issue that our society needs to address. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And we're prepared. We're ready to go to battle with the government. And we believe that in the end, justice will win. Thank you. No, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Betty, for joining us tonight. I know there's a number of people who might be watching tonight and might have uh, numerous questions about how this class action could apply to them, whether they're eligible, so forth. So we're going to ask you a couple of questions, and then we'll take some further questions later on in the evening um, to have some questions from the audience as well. So my first question for you this evening is, the claim argues that the plaintiffs have been subjected to black employee exclusion. For those watching tonight who may not know if they've been affected exactly by black employee exclusion, can you explain to us what that is exactly so they can determine whether they qualify as a potential plaintiff? Well, the key, the key element of what we've done is we've carved a very unique claim looking at what the losses and all the restrictions. So our claim is focused on the lack of hiring and the lack of promotion. What's, what's, what's important about that is this is data that is quantifiable. So we're retaining experts from universities, auditors, and just going through all the data to be able to demonstrate that a black employee, right now we believe takes 13 years before they're gonna get a promotion within the public service, while other groups are looking at potentially 10 years. We have so many individuals that have served for 30 years that have never received a promotion despite all of the elements of doing their job. So we're really focusing on that narrow element because of the legal path that we needed to take, which is hiring and promotions for black public service workers. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. The next question I have for you is what about black candidates that apply for jobs in the public service and were denied? Are they eligible for the claim as well? Or is this lawsuit only for those who have actually held a position within the federal government? Well, we're, we're, we're discovering that the hiring process is also internal as well for individuals that want to go to other departments, that there are many issues that, that, uh, that impact there, but also many individuals have, made, have gone through the hiring process, you know, and a personal story, I, when I was hired by the RCMP, before I was hired, I was one of three candidates and the staff sergeant said to me, you're, you know, um, you're one of the better candidates, but you're black and you're going to have to be working with officers who may have seen blacks in negative light. And I said to him, give me an opportunity. It worked out to be a fantastic situation for me. But otherwise, another officer, another sar uh, staff sergeant may have said, well, because you're black, we know that you're not going to be able to properly interact with these officers, officers and there would have been a denial. So we also want to focus on those individuals who have come forward, who have applied for a job, who've met all the requirements, who know that they had it all down pat, and for some reason they were refused. Um, so, no, that's definitely a really good point, and I think that's an experience that so many, unfortunately, Black workers have experienced in the federal government as well. This class action lawsuit isn't, this type of class action lawsuit isn't technically unprecedented. In 2017, the federal government reached an agreement in principle 
in a class action lawsuit against the former um, LGBTQ2 plus public service workers whose careers were either sidelined or ended because of their sexual orientation. The government set aside $100 million to compensate these workers, $250,000 to fund community projects that combat homophobia. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau himself gave a public apology. Are you hoping for a similar outcome for black workers? Well, I, I really believe that, you know, we've looked at the precedents that are there. Whether you look at the indigenous community, whether you look at the LBGT uh, class action, the purge case that, uh, that was argued by Doug Elliott, who's one of the advisors on our team, whether you look at the RCMP harassment case for women, um, but we're not seeing that element of goodwill coming from the government right now. And we're feeling that, you know, black workers may potentially be shortchanged in the same manner that they have been in the past. We just have not seen any indication that the government at this point in time is prepared to do the right thing. No, duly noted. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Betty. We're going to have you on later when we're taking some more questions directly from the audience. Thank you so much. It's time to watch another powerful testimony from one of the other plaintiffs in the class action lawsuit. Here is the story of Caroline Lane. My name is Caroline Lane. I've done a total of 37 years with the RCMP. I never got a promotion. The biggest challenge I faced was uh, many people didn't really acknowledge me. If someone come into the room and I am there, they would ask me, oh, can I speak to somebody about certain things? And I says, well, you can talk to me. I'm the somebody. And they would say, oh, isn't there somebody else over you? Why even look for a promotion? Because around the room, within the RCMP, when I was hired, I was the only, if you should use the word, black person working there. I never um, got that opportunity to supervise anyone. Not that. I didn't know the job. Not receiving the promotion made me upset over the years because I've, I've noticed so many others come in that didn't have the experience that I have. One superintendent had needed a secretary, and I figure I can do that job. And I voiced my opinion that I wanted that job. I learned that that superintendent said he didn't want a black girl to be working there because when the other members and officers, everybody comes in, they would see the first person who would greet them would be the black girl. I had to work three times harder than the other girls in the office. You don't just look at somebody and because of the skin color, you say, she's black, I'm not going to take her. If they have the credentials and if they have the capabilities, why not? Why not give that person an opportunity? Treat uh, every individual as a human being. Treat everyone as a human being should be a very simple but yet powerful statement. Shouldn't even need to be said. We thank Caroline for sharing her story this evening. Some of you watching tonight might not be eligible to join the suit, but want to support the class action. The class action has already received the support of several unions, such as the Public Service Alliance of Canada, the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada, and the Union of Taxation Employees, and we thank them so much for their support. The Black Class Action team are calling on allies of the Black community, whether individuals or their unions and locals, to help them get justice for decades of discrimination in Canada's public service by donating to this historic legal action. Any donations will go to covering all court fees, legal fees and administrative fees. Funds are also needed for research, special examiners, national and community outreach costs and more. 
All donations will be transferred into a trust supporting the litigation of the Black class action. Any funds transferred out of the trust will be legally accounted for and will be presented to the court at the conclusion of the litigation. Any unused portion of the fund will be donated to a fund advocating for equity issues for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. To donate, head to blackclassaction.ca, or if you're watching this evening on the website, you can look at the top of your website. At the top of your screen, you will see a donate button, and that is where you can donate to this class action. Continuing the reactions of leaders in the labor movement, we have a message of support from Debbie Davio, president of the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada. PIPs, as they're also known, represent some 60,000 public service professionals and scientists employed at the federal and some provincial territorial levels of government. To the plaintiffs listening tonight, she says, we're honored to support your efforts to end systemic anti-Black discrimination in the federal public service. The government has acknowledged that systemic racism is prevalent in Canadian society and within government institutions, but words are not enough. It's time for action. It's time to end anti-Black discrimination in the government's own hiring and promoting practices. Thank you, Debbie Davio, for sending that message this evening. Also joining us tonight is Yolanda McLean, president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists Canada. CBTU, as it's also known, works to fulfill the dream of Black trade unionists, both living and deceased, who throughout Canada's labour history have courageously and unremittedly struggled to build a national movement that brings the collective strength and very talents of Black workers to bear in an unending effort to achieve economic, political and social justice for all. Please welcome Yolanda. Good evening, my name is Yolanda McLean, the president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. We recognize that systemic and institutionalized racism is endemic within the federal public services, core public administration, and has not been acknowledged or addressed to its entirety as of now. Anti-Black racism is one of the gravest injustices plaguing the Canadian federal public service, who claims to be a representation of its citizens using diversity as one of its core values. We're calling on the current federal government to implement the several recommendations that they and their successors have received through various internal advocacy campaigns regarding how to address the glaring underrepresentation of black employees in executive and assistant deputy ministers roles and to advocate for and implement the demands that the plaintiffs are seeking in their lawsuits. Black federal public servants are long overdue for justice as the federal public service has deep roots with systemic discrimination. Hiring and advancement practice must change now. In addition, modernization and amendments to the Public Service Employment Act and other legislation and regulations regarding staffing, promotions and appointments are needed and must be prioritized in order to address the inequities and barriers affecting disadvantaged public service employees. Staffing should be part of the collective bargaining process as clearly the federal government is failing. Its role, duty and responsibilities on this matter. Diversity, respect and inclusion should be a bona fide requirement in order to correct past malpractices and injustices. The federal government has acknowledged systemic racism is prevalent in Canadian society and within government institutions. No more empty words or promises. The time is now to take responsibility, actions, and define the present and future of its public service. The Coalition of Black Trade Unionist Canadian Chapter supports the legal action taken on behalf of past and present federal public service workers who identify as Black, Caribbean, or of African descent. Thank you for this opportunity and have a great evening. Thank you, Lolanda, for those important words. You can learn more about the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists at cbtu.ca. We thank you. Everybody who is joining us this evening, we thank you so much for taking the time to watch and participate this evening. We really encourage all of you to share 
tonight's streams on your social media platforms. Head over to Facebook and Twitter and make sure that you're sharing tonight's feed so many more can join us tonight. We have another important reaction from a leader in Canada's political sphere. Selena Caesar Chavan is an entrepreneur and a former member of parliament until 2019. She was the first black person to be elected to the federal writing of Whitby. Selena became a social media sensation for advocating for gender and racial equality in the House of Commons. She made headlines when she publicly spoke out about racist microaggressions she experienced while working on Parliament Hill. Illustrating that anti-Black sentiments reached the highest levels of Canadian government and public service. Please welcome Selena. Hi, my name is Selena Caesar Chavan. I am a consultant and advisor. I was a former member of Parliament for the town of Whitby, former Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister and Parliamentary Secretary to International Development. I first heard about the black class action lawsuit uh, through social media and to be honest was really intrigued because uh, it sort of was a continuation from my previous role in the fact that um, as a member of parliament my job was really to advocate for equity and to ensure that we were looking after the most vulnerable in our society. And then I had a few people coming into my office who worked for the public service, and they described these stories to me. But you could see the pain in their faces about the years that they put in, the amount of times they got looked passed over for jobs, and it, it, really, it hurt me. My last act as a member of parliament was tabling a bill that would force the public service to look at the barriers that existed for promotion within the public service, particularly for black individuals, and it was Bill 468. When we look at the, the DEI, the diversity, equity, and inclusion framework, that black people tend not to be benefactors of the strides that we've made around diversity and inclusion. Someone who works in for civic engagement is a public servant who is taking care of the well-beings of Canadians, that at the very least we treat them with dignity. We make that space equitable. We have some humanity built into that space. And when you hear these stories from the nucleus of our country, then what does that say to the rest, to the rest of us and to the rest of our institutions? I support all black workers who are seeking justice through this class action suit. Why do we need to do this now? Because the urgency now demands that we do it right now. Thank you, Selena. The urgency and time to do this kind of work is definitely now. Selena has published Can You Hear Me Now, both memoir and leadership book detailing her experiences as a businesswoman and member of parliament. You can pick up a copy of at Indigo and Amazon if you would like to hear more about her story. It is time to watch another important testimony from a plaintiff in the class action lawsuit. All of these videos will be available at the end of tonight's evening on the social media platforms for the blackclassaction.ca. Here is the story of Carol Sip. This is Carol Pamela Sip on the occasion of your retirement from the public service. I wish to thank you on behalf of the Department and people of Canada for 26 years of loyal service and to extend to you our best wishes. I haven't hung it up. Too many awful memories. The way I was treated the way I was held back, no, no promotions. I started with the Department of National Defense and there was no room for promotion there. Took interviews with Gateway Postal Services and Canada Customs. I passed for both places, but I chose Border Services because I thought there'd be more opportunities, but I was wrong. My first case was with a supervisor, he would say derogatory remarks and so forth. I brought it to management's attention and they did nothing about it. So I wrote to Ottawa and when internal affairs came, 
they found a lot of things that were going on that shouldn't have been going on. I won my cases first with sexual harassment and the other one was discrimination. But it was not easy. After a few months or a year or so, the harassment started again. When the union first came in, they told me, they thought that they'd protect me by getting me into the union, right? But it really did not work. The supervisors began harassing me like I was labeled a troublemaker. The stress took a physical toll on me, which affected my mental health because I was very sick. I got hurt on the job and I wasn't getting better. It was a very low time in my life. I continued going to work even though I was sick until one day the doctor called me and he says, leave there right now and go see your psychiatrist. I would like things to change for the young people that would like to join the public service. We are all human beings. See no color, see no race. That's it. Mm, see no color, see no race. Another heart-rendering story from a long-term public service worker. It's incredibly moving to listen to the lived experience of workers in their own words, especially for myself, listening to Caroline and Carol's, like listening to my own aunties and their experience working in the government for years and the unfortunate experiences they have felt of not being valued as a worker. It's heartbreaking. All of the video testimonies you watched tonight will be available on the Black Class Action social media accounts, and we encourage you to share them we encourage everybody to share these stories and really get the word out on many of those who could be eligible for this important lawsuit. Many of you watching tonight might have numerous questions about the Black Class Section lawsuit and how it may apply to you. So we will take a few more questions for those of you who are joining us tonight while we have the expertise of Mr. Betty available to us. I'm going to ask Mr. Courtney Betty to join me again and to take some questions from the audience. Thank you, Tasha. And I, I think the one thing, having been involved here, is the emotional, you, you just can't help but yeah. feel the pain of these individuals. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's just incredible when you look at their stories. The pain that they've endured for so many years. So long. So we're going to take a few questions um, from the audience. I did see someone, um, Erica, Eiffel, she has asked, what about accountability mechanisms? What kind of, uh, what will we be asking for in the class action? The, a bit, the part of the class action, there's twofold. First of all, we would like people that have suffered damages. It's just a natural thing for them to be compensated. The class action also is asking an order for mandamus where we can actually work with the government to put together a five-year plan that would create a situation of upward mobility for the existing public service workers and for new workers. And also an element of being able to ensure that the training that's going to take place, when we talk about diversity and inclusion training, unfortunately, in many situations, that's not coming from members of the Black workers. Um, we have individual agencies that will come in. So we've got a major part of the plan is an order from mandamus asking the government to actually come up with a five-year plan and project, you know, what we'd really like to see is in five years, um, the public service actually reflect at all levels the, the amount of blacks in the population. So if we're 5.8% of the population, we would like to see 5.8% of blacks in management positions, not necessarily only at the lower levels. And that's the big focus mm -hmm. for us, is that plan uh, moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Starting to see Black workers having a more wider breadth in terms of their experience and positions in the government. Thank you so much for that question, Erica. We have another question now from Sarah. Has PSCC contributed and do they 
uh, they, um, and whether you know that they have pro provided um, dues towards that. Um, I think that PSCC, in terms of um, their support, they have already expressed their great support in supporting this class action lawsuit, and um, they have been seeking intervenous status in this particular case. So the union itself will be providing that kind of support there. And, and I just want to thank, it's not just, you know, the union, it's all the other individuals such as yourself, such as Amakai. There's so many others that have come, the lawyers from PSAC that have come on board. So we're, we're working together as a team. And I think the reason that that's important is that this is what I believe comes from the leadership. When we began to do the research, uh, many of the statements that Chris had made very early on, many years ago, over and over, just kept on inspiring us that we should keep moving. So certainly from uh, the Public Service Alliance of Canada, you know, we've created a strong team approach and really looking forward to, uh, to moving things ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's extremely important that all unions come together and can support their workers in this important class action suit. Um, we have another question from the audience. Plaintiffs named in the class action is in large part, most of the members are part of a union. So uh, whether it's PSEC or PIPS or another bargaining agent, how can unionized workers take part in a class action? Can you explain maybe why also the class action route has been taken in this case instead of a policy grievance? Well, that's a great question. Um, so when we looked at the case, we saw many obstacles initially uh, because, because usually it would be a situation where a collective bargaining agreement, you'd have to go through a, a grievance process, you've got to go to the labor board, You've got to go to the Human Rights Commission in terms of trying to find resolutions. What's interesting, as I, as I think Chris has pointed out, the element of promote, hiring and promotion is usually outside of the public service collective bargaining agreement. So that's one of the major issues that we had to contend with because the courts in Canada have taken the position that where there is a, a collective bargaining agreement, that that should govern. Um, so we've been working along and putting that component forward and really leveraging that. But we also have individuals that are not unionized. And so that sort of, you know, legal uh, catch that we that normally would apply, we've been able to create a path to overcome that hurdle. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we also have a, another question from Carol. She says that these testimonies are a common assault across all organizations. Would Crown Corporations also be included in the class action? Yeah, so when you, we've effectively taken the definition of the public service from the government, which is over 200 different organizations, which also include crown corporations. So when you think of it in that context, you can see the magnitude of the case that we're dealing with in terms of collecting a lot of this data going back 50 years and being able to present a statistical clear-cut analysis demonstrating how black public service workers have been maligned over the last 50 years. And I saw another question from Patrick asking about the financial support from unions. And I think we kind of talked about that a little bit earlier about um, various unions who might, may not necessarily have members in this class action, but um, are not necessarily seeking intervenous status in this particular case, but if they would like to lend their support, um, they can do so as well. Well, I think the, 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 there are two parts to this. There's the legal side, and we've got a really great legal team. We're proud of the individuals that have come forward, and they came forward. We were, you know, we're not all members of one law firm. They came forward because they believed in the fight for justice and equity from all different backgrounds. The second part of it is we have a petition right now that, as of uh, I think yesterday, we had over 5,000 people that signed this petition. This really is a decision that the government has to make. Do they want to stand up and do the right thing at this point in time and begin the process? It's not going to happen overnight. That's why we're projecting five years. But within our leadership, you can certainly put pressure on your members of parliament and the government to try and get them to do the right thing by taking a step, sitting down with the workers, sitting down with the unions, and coming up with a go forward. Thank you so much. We have another question from Sodu. Would you clarify who can be part of the class action? Is it just the plaintiffs that would benefit from a possible win? Although we never lose, either we win or we learn. Well, any member that fits within the class, uh, part of the 
the goal of getting a certification is that you've got a very narrow class. So anyone that fits within the definition of black, and you know, that's something that we grapple with, but that at the end of the day um, is a definition that we've adopted, is certainly able to participate and sign up. You know, even individuals that you've seen, some of the individuals that are retired, that are seniors, that are still feeling that pain, and young people right now whose dreams are being, you know, today uh, there was a story in regards to the governor general and a young black woman, 23 years old, who had her dreams shattered. Individuals such as that are definitely eligible to participate in this. Absolutely. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. I saw from Sodu, he also asked, or he or she also asked if there's, what can people do? What can people do to support the class action even if they aren't necessarily plaintiffs in it? I think the greatest thing that we can do is recognize that we have to build a mobilization among people of all, you know, we're, we're all Canadians. We, we really believe, I mean, I love Canada. I believe in Canada, all the public service workers, we became public service workers because we wanted to make our country better. This right now is a really bad mark against Canada that will, you know, forever be there. So we have a chance to step forward, to unite, whether you're part of the claim or not, to be able to bring about this change because our grandchildren, um, our children, grandchildren, they're all going to be benefactors. But if we don't do anything now, we don't know when that opportunity is gonna arise again. Absolutely, we wanna create a better word for our children. Absolutely. Once again, Mr. Betty, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening and answer all of these really important questions. No problem at all. Thank you for uh, this opportunity and for everyone else. It's, giving us that support. One of the most incredible part for me is how individuals such as the ones that you've seen have come forward despite their pain. And one of the things I've learned is every time you tell the story, you're actually reliving and experiencing that pain. And so they've been very brave, but also many other individuals and organizations that have come forward and saying, you know, we want to be a part of this change. So we just want to continue building that momentum, working along with, uh, with you know, PSAC and PIPS and other organization to get this accomplished. Absolutely, thank you so much, Mr. Betty. So to wrap up this evening on an inspiring note, the Black Class Action Team is launching a special music video. A new song titled For the People was commissioned to commemorate black workers and honor the contributions of black people in Canada, specifically during Black History Month. The song is performed by Promise and O Sound, and the music video is directed by Sarah Bazo. As a special treat, joining us tonight is the performing artist himself, Promise. Promise is a Canadian hip hop soul recording artist from Toronto. He is an award winning artist who has collaborated with the likes of Janae Aiko, Montel Jordan, Lecrae, and fellow Toronto native rapper Drake. Promise, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So before the national premiere of your new release, For the People, can you tell us a little bit about this piece and the inspiration behind it? Um, I wanted to show the struggles, you know, of, of fellow Black people, not just Black workers, but um, Black people who've been portrayed in history to, to push past adversities and, you know, stuff like that. But I didn't want to just stay there. I wanted to also show the light at the end of the tunnel, the, the better day, the promise, the hope for a better life. Yeah, absolutely. Being able to tell those important stories, but still giving hope in the end. Yeah, um, yeah. I was actually privileged to listen and watch the music video before tonight's event. The song not only has a great vibe, but of course has a very powerful message as well. What are you hoping people will take away after they hear the song or watch the video? That, that there is hope for change. That, you know, some people I know, especially those who unfortunately went through those times and, you know, may not have seen change, that there can be change. Absolutely. So without further ado, we want to premiere this great track for everyone watching tonight. And I think it's only right that I throw it back to you. I want you to introduce this video for everyone tonight. All right, my name is Promise. This song is featuring a good friend of mine, O Sound, and it is called For the People. Enjoy. Hey, 
I've been talking to various women. They all know Harriet Tubman. They want to know about the weight that we carry in public. There was a time when a wife couldn't marry her husband. There was a time she couldn't share that she loved him. Some parents are from this still carrying grudges. And they say, okay, just get over it. It's done. But to understand the why, you got to know where it's from. Look, I got white friends. Even they don't understand why one black man would hate one that's light skinned. It's crazy because the brothers, where they come from, like, how could someone hate just based upon the color? I know, right? crazy when you say it on its own right i'm just saying when you place it in its own light like i'm saying the concept alone like crazy look i know this might not be you and there's others i just hope there might not be few if you just listen and your vision just might not be skewed and i might not be viewed as less we're liberated in love but it starts with yourself Go ahead and free yourself from the hate you feel. We're no longer the same. We're not separate but equal. We just wanna see change. We need a heart for the people. No. This goes out to all the various workers on the front line sharing your service. Uh. I know you carrying burdens, but I thank you for staying right there in your purpose. Uh. They don't care if you're serving. They treat you low, like right there with the vermin. Uh. Try and be careful with word and I want to make sure your narrative is heard because you deserve it. Uh, no matter what it looks like, uh, I want it to look right further. Uh, and no matter what it looks like, it'll be better than all this hurting. <laughs> look after we gather together and say that we'd rather not have it this way and we'd rather be happy today. I'm just saying that black workers matter, okay? We're liberated in love, but it's starts with yourself go ahead and free yourself from the hate you feel we're no longer the same we're not separate but equal we just want to see change we need a heart for the people yeah. look when they say save the rainforest do you see other trees and leaves like that ain't forest what i'm saying is the same course can be sung for anyone in need of the same force huh. so spread love like you want to be loved you know the song right and if you don't just stand there and nod like this if we could do that i think we'll be all right we're no longer the same we're not separate but equal we just want to see change we need a heart for the people we're no longer the same we're not separate but equal we just want to see change we need a heart for the people What a beautiful piece of music that truly captures the enduring spirit and great contributions of Black people and walk and workers across the nation. We want to thank Promise for joining us tonight and giving us the gift of that song. Everybody needs to be calling their radio stations tomorrow and requesting that this song be playing across Canada. For the people, the music video will be, pre be premiering on YouTube right after tonight's event. We're asking for everyone, I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. Go give it a watch. Let's get those views up and definitely be sharing it. The song will also be available across music platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, so definitely be listening to it over the next couple of weeks and months. As we said, all the video testimonies you watch tonight will also be available on the Black Class Action YouTube and social media accounts following tonight's event, and we wanna to continue to encourage you to share and spread the word and really tell all of these inspirational pieces and share these stories so we can spread awareness. We wanna thank all of our great speakers and contributors tonight. I wanna to especially thank all of you who have watched live and participated in tonight's event. If you have any further questions or are seeking more information, you can visit the blackclassaction.ca website where you can sign up, donate, read more about this historic lawsuit. You can follow the Black Class Action social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, to be kept up to date on the latest developments in the lawsuit. 
We encourage all of you to share the news and spread the word with colleagues, families, neighbors, and especially those who may be eligible to join this legal action. Thank you again for joining us this evening, and I wish everyone a safe and sound good night.